This conference will now be recorded. Good evening and welcome to the Alpena City Council meeting of December 6, 2021. Call the order, please. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilman Mitchell. Here. Councilman Noah. Here. Councilman Osmer. Here. And Mayor Longborn. Here. Please rise for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Nation. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Noah? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Yes. And Mayor Willowbar? Aye. Any proposed modifications to said agenda? Mm -hmm. All right, approval of the minutes for regular session of November 15th, 2021. Any issues or changes? Or... Okay, citizens appearing before council on agenda and non-agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your concerns. If you'd like to do so, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our records. This will be the only time uh, this evening uh, that uh, the public is allowed to speak. My name is Marshall Simmons. Um, I live at 1260 Lakeshore Drive in Harrisville. And the reason that I wanted to attend tonight's meeting it's because I haven't been a former resident of Alpena and Alpena Township. My family owned seven lots at Evergreen Cemetery beginning in 1917. I watch over those lots and I watch over another 11 lots belonging to family and friends. My comments are about the investment of the 1 million plus balance in the perpetual care fund. I believe strongly that at least 20% or more of that money should remain in a savings account to be easily accessible, okay? Any interest earned on an account belongs to that account. Otherwise, that account will diminish due to inflation. Okay. Evergreen Cemetery represents the very fabric of the lives and early years of this city. Previous council members are buried there. Most of those people up there are buried there. Our first teachers, firefighters, law officers, veterans, saloon keepers, as well as the lady that died in 1927 after being overcome by fumes and her place of employment. We understand the, the importance of preserving the area from their convictions and their expectations. Now, the first cemetery ordinance was written in 1874 and it expresses the comments and events it expresses their concerns. The first ordinance states clearly that the city promises that the grounds, buildings, enclosures, and impurities are improved and are kept in good condition and repair. It's the people's understanding of the whole area of the cemetery, uh, not just their grave sites there. Okay. As you may know, the metal fence and entrance gate was installed in 1907 to replace the deteriorated wooden fence during the same time as the construction of this building. A small portion came from the city funds with the majority coming being raised in the community. Since 1918, those people buried at Evergreen and their families have contributed to the fund to maintain and improve the graves where their graves are located. The fence is symbolic of their interest to keep the cow, sheep, and deer out. It's symbolic of many other items too. We continue adding, the people have continued adding to the cemetery's care, to the funds for that care. It demonstrates their dedication and appearance of the dedication and interest in the appearance of the cemetery. So in a sense, the community has paid forward and there should be a sense of obligation to our, our people that have come before us to have maintained that appearance 
and that appearance is, is involved in the fence. Okay. If people have paid forward, you have more than a million dollars in that, in that perpetual care fund. I'm constantly hearing people tell me that you can't touch the funds. The lawyers say you can't touch it. The judge say you can't touch it. Everybody says you can't touch it. But nobody's looking back at history of what the intent of that fund was. And I don't think it should be ignored. Okay, in the early, the early documents, the early documents, uh, thank you. The early documents for the perpetual care to explain the fund, the purpose of the fund, it says including uh, the trees and the grass and the watering and the resodding. You can take resodding out because it doesn't apply anymore. Resodding meant filling the opening or the, the sunken area after the body when the, and the wooden box was gone. We now use the vault so they don't have need for resodding. Maybe the grassing, but sodding is an old term. Um, so the, oh, here it is, the, um, the Perpetual care certificates said, event, early ones said, shall include. Shall include does not mean limited to. Other aspects have been, I've already mentioned. But the fence and the entrance represent the interest then and now and the concern for a protected location for burial. It means it's a welcoming place, an inviting place, a place with special focus on remembering, honoring, and respecting. Our culture uses the term rest in peace and pearly gates. Again, it's a conveying a welcoming area. The fence defines that area that was protected and cared for. It. It's a very visual reminder of that and stands as the perimeter of a special area, just as church walls do. When you pass through that majestic entrance arch, it's similar to entering a church with a profound feeling and focus of attention. The entrance is used for funerals and at one time for parades on Memorial Day and 4th of July. Social organizations use the entrance of, as processions. Uh, people, uh, groups such as the Maccabees, Oddfellows, Mason, and other groups. Okay. Now that the entrance and interior of the cemetery do attract other people, photographers, family genealogies, walkers, and visitors. The website Find a Grave has a profound increase on attention to that cemetery. But through that website, people check on their family. So you have to keep that in mind about the issue of abandonment. You have to finish in 30 seconds, please. Do I have what? You have 30 seconds to finish. Go to where first? You only have 30 seconds more. Now it's 10. <laughs> I wish the council would embrace the return of the cemetery films, the continued support for the entrance and the arch. It's important to honor the past and honor the people that have accomplished that just as the city council members did in 1906 and 1907. The money's already there. The majority of the people I meet are interested in, in Evergreen, are very quiet people. They are not loudly spoken or wish to be the focus of the public meetings. This is also true for those that attend my cemetery walks and presentations. Just because we're not outspoken doesn't mean we should be minimized. The city council in 1905 have the legacy of the evergreen fence and gates. You as a group, you have the honor of administering that area and you could have the pride of, you could have the pride in returning the fence and the gates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Angie Skiba, 635 River. I am not sure if I understood at the last meeting that you were contemplating the investment of the million dollars, but did not make that plan. Is that correct? Did not make the decision. So I'm concerned that we have a million dollars in the perpetual care fund. And before it's completely committed for investment, 
we, I feel we need a detailed review for possible use of the replacement of the fence by the city attorney and to delve into the fine details of the possible use. Steve said, I spoke to Steve before the meeting today that uh, the way things are written, that it appears that it's probably not able to be used that way, but I want an in-depth investigation before we invest a million dollars. And I also, if we as the city and the money that's been able to be invested, for example, any contract that you write with anyone else, you're able to make the details work in your favor. If, if we as the city are um, investing this type of money, you have the right to write in a contract that you will have access to part of that money and they can make that exception or they don't need to accept all your money. And I'm gonna guess that they will take your money. Say you say you possibly invest $500,000 and then you would keep the $500,000 in the other account if we're able to use it. Work on replacing that fence. There are many people in Alpena that are very upset. The fence was removed and they wanna know where it is, why it's removed. Um, you try and answer that question, but it's not my place to answer. I say call, call here and, and ask. Uh, so there are many people that are very upset that it has not been addressed and has not been taken care of. But I feel if we do proceed in investing part of that money, at least you write it in there and you make the options in any contract you do of those choices. So I would make that work for the city, not just necessarily for their portion, but please investigate that before that money is invested. Thank you. Angie. And just a, I'm just going to comment really quick for you and Marsha, since you're both right here. Yes. Um, we've investigated that that money. It's state statute tells us what we can and can't do with that money. I don't want to discuss it right now, but it's limited to zero. Um, what we can do with that money, that money has to be invested and we can only spend the interest off of whatever the investment is, which is which is why we're trying to invest it somewhere where we will make the most interest. So, um, and Anna, will, maybe when she brings it back to, to council for that final decision, whenever that is, she can quote again, again, um, the statute that basically tells us what we can and can't do with it. And perhaps you'll log in or be here for that as well. Um, if I could get that in writing before that, I'd appreciate that. It'll be in the city, pit city packet or you can, email it to all the information is in the last meeting's packet um, it, it, the bill is in there of what we can actually spend it on um, so that would be a good resource to check out okay thank you yeah yeah I knew it was I knew it was something that we read just recently so it was in the last packet uh, anyone else live I'd like to speak to council anybody on the line it is who Oh, okay. Kevin? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening. Uh, just, uh, I was there in November and in person uh, and uh, just wanted to let you know I was here and, and would be happy to discuss when we get to the uh, draft uh, marijuana ordinance. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I said that I would circle back with uh, the city of attorney um, between the last meeting and this one and and this meeting kind of snuck up on me I was tied up uh, with with a number of other urgent matters but um, in general I, I think that the this ordinance is is good and, and it's forward progress um, there are some um, things that I would suggest maybe you reconsider or, or think about um, one would be the the local licensing authority um, that kind of creates a, a new um level of bureaucracy that I've, I've seen in other ordinances elsewhere in the state and not seen that work well anywhere um so and and at a minimum if you did want to go that route um there would be some cleanup because there are pl lots of places where it says the clerk has certain powers that this section this new proposed section would put in this new bureaucratic entity um and, and I'll just leave it for there for now and, and um, don't want to get too much down to the nitty gritty details, but you know, in general, I think this is a great ordinance. There's a, a couple little things that I would um, suggest you consider or reconsider um, in terms of minor tweaks 
based on you know experience elsewhere in the state and seeing what has worked and what hasn't. Um, but I'm I'm happy we're even having these conversations and and happy to be part of them. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kevin. Anyone else out there, Charlie? All right, thank you. Uh, no public hearing this evening, so we have a consent agenda that's relatively lengthy. Uh, so I will uh, get through that. Uh, a is bills to be allowed in the amount of $631,763.68. B is the approval of the consulting services for the ARPA grant. C is a council appointment of Nicholas Lee to the Recreational Advisory Board for a three-year term expiring on December 1st, 2024. D is the approval of a 2022 council meeting schedule. E is the approval of a Memorial Day, uh, 4th of July and Christmas parades held within the city limits in 2022. F is the approval of a budget amendment request to reduce general fund balance by $11,322 due to a discovery of a budget error. G is approval of a budget amendment request to increase general fund balance by $22,662 due to the personal property tax reimbursement being higher than budgeted and to amend the budget after a review of the October monthly financial reports. H is uh, PA 152 insurance opt out. I is the Alpena County Youth and Recreation Grant Agreement for Culligan Plaza. J is the Economic Development Administration Grant Application Submittal and Solutions. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Nowak? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Right. And Mayor Fortem Johnson? Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, we have report of officers. First is the 2022 property and liability insurance bid recommendation. And I was here for that. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. On November 18th, the city received and opened bids for property and liability insurance. The request for proposal was emailed to three firms as well as posted on the city's website with three proposals received as follows. The first bid was from Alpena Agency, who works with um, Argonaut Insurance Company and Travelers Property and Casualty. Their base premium was $149,998 with an optional bid of $143,999. The second bid was from Lappin Agency. Their carrier is Tokyo Marine and HCC Insurance Group. The base bid was $130,363 for year one, and then second and third years would change um, with exposures. The third bid was from the Michigan Municipal League and uh, their carrier is the MML Liability and Property Pool. So they are self-insured. Um, the base bid is $139,948. They only do one-year policies, um, so they don't have a three-year policy as, um, as we had requested in the bid specs. City Manager Smolinski and I conducted a review of the proposals and decided that we would like to move forward with the proposal from the MML as it best meets the needs of the city. I called the three listed references and only received one return call, which was from the City of Traverse City clerk. He stated that their city has been insured with the MML since 1986 and has had a great experience to date. Their claims process is consistent and timely, coverages are sufficient, and exclusions are not overboard. He performs a comprehensive market analysis every three years to be sure that the MML's rates are in line with other companies and found them to be the best around. He said that the premiums do increase about two to 3% each year and he highly recommends insuring with the MML. An added benefit that the MML offers is the payment of dividends. The pool dividend for members five years and over renewing in 2022 is 10% of their 2021 renewal premium. In year one, we would receive 10% of the calculated 10% dividend. So it'd be 10% of the $13,994. In year two, it would increase to 25%. In years three, four, and five, it would be 50, 75%, and 100% respectively. 
Hypothetically, if we would have been with the MML for five years and paid $139,948 in 2021, the city's 2022 dividend would be $13,994. If we join in 2021, our first year portion in 22 will be $1,399. I'd like to point out that the MML offers $100,000 sewer backup liability, while the other two bidders offer a million dollars. I was concerned about this, so I reached out to the MML and was informed that in the last four years, there were 107 sewer backup claims for a total of 1.1 million. Only two of those claims actually exceeded 100,000. So having this knowledge, I still feel comfortable moving forward with MML. Another concern that I looked into was the coverage of ice damage to our docks. The MML claims manager said that although there is a property exclusion for impact damage to docks, piers, and wharves, they have paid claims to docks and piers. Coverage is based on the facts and merits of the claim. Other benefits and differences that were noted include significantly higher limits of liability for municipal general liability, public officials liability, law enforcement liability, and automobile liability. The deductibles are also lower on numerous coverages or non-existent. The pool ensures more than 433 public entity members, 139 fire departments, 170 law enforcement agencies, 2,195 police officers, 5,772 miles of streets and roads, 6,950 vehicles, 195 water utilities, 218 sewer utilities, 24 municipal marinas, 206 water service operations, 17 dams, and has $5 billion of property values. It is my recommendation as clerk treasurer finance director to award the property and liability bid to the Michigan Municipal League for an annual premium of $139,948 for 2022. And it's just the, the first question that came to mind is one I think that we got answered, but I wanted to ask it again. Um, not all insurance companies are apples to apples. It's usually an apple to an orange. Can you highlight for council some of the differences that you see between this particular policy that they're going for and, and some of the others that we have? I knew that you would ask or someone would. Um, so I did a comparison and like you said, you know, it is hard to compare them. Um, so as part of our bid specs, we had a questionnaire in there and I transferred those questions onto a spreadsheet and just put the responses from each bidder. Some of the differences um, that I noticed, as I had mentioned in my memo, for the municipal general liability, public officials, law enforcement, automobile liabilities, all of those limits of liability are $10 million each. Whereas with the other two, um, it's 1 million per occurrence or a $3 million aggregate limit. So that means if there's more than one claim in a year, it would max out at 3 million. Um, some of the other differences that I noticed, our, um, our comprehensive coverage on vehicles is only $250 deductible, whereas with the other two is $1,000. Um, as I mentioned, sewer backup is lower at 100,000, um, but I think in the explanation I was given from MML that it is justified. Um, let's see what else here. Property coverage, um, the deductibles with the other two are 5,000 and with MML it's only 500. There's no deductibles for uh, many of the crime coverage, including employee dishonesty, loss inside the premise, loss outside the premises, money orders and counterfeit paper. And also our marine operators legal liability is $10 million of coverage, whereas the other two are a million. The property, I think I already mentioned that about the property coverage deductible. Um, building and personal property, so contents, um, $500 deductible with MML, nothing is listed with Alpena Agency, and then $5,000 with Lappin Agency. Uh, 
loss of uh, there's a lot of highlights on here i apologize uh boiler and machinery coverage it's one thousand dollar deductible with lapin um 5000 with alpina agency 500 with mml Vehicles, maybe. Vehicles? Vehicles. Um, yeah, so I, I believe the collision is still a thousand. Not sure why I don't have it printed out. Um, it's a thousand, and then the only one that's different is the, the comprehensive with MML is 250. Does that answer your question? Go on. Um, yeah. You know, because bids and stuff like that. I, <laughs> I usually like the lower one, but sometimes it's like as we've done in, in past on other different you know, vehicles, do prepping out vehicles and stuff, and always the lowest prices and usually the best deal in the long run. So reading, you know, what I what we, we went over here on the memo and such, I, I thought this actually sounded. Hearing that sounded like a a better long-term fit for what we're looking for in that. Um, that's just my opinion, of course, but I just wanted to understand it a little bit. More. Yeah. Some additional research that I did earlier today, um, I was trying to figure out how much we've paid in deductibles to LAPN agency over the course of the last three years that we've been insured with them. And it's at least 17,000. And I ran those same um, incidents um with the mml and they said it'd be twelve thousand. Okay. so uh with lap and agency it's at least 17 there might be a little bit more but um i didn't get an answer in time for this meeting i think that um the dividends is is a is a very nice benefit we have workers comp insurance with them and that that also reduces our premium for that as well kind of like a we've been insured with them for a long time so we're always getting that benefit and once we get up to um about year four we should be below the low bid we should be like in the 120 high range okay and the every insurance company if i understand correctly will review all of your claims to set your premium for the next year? Is that is that common practice? Where they kind of look at all the different claims that maybe you've put on and to reset your? Oh, um, I'm not sure how that works. Um, Connie Munson with MML is available online. Maybe she could answer that question for us. Sure. What was the question again? Uh, with the rates that are set, is it a review of all of the uh, expenses or payouts that we've had in the year prior is that how that works how we mean how we do our rates yes um your your rates uh are promulgated by the pool based upon the entire program's uh history with losses so then after that after we have our rates set we actually have an actuarial firm that helps us determine what the rate should be from year to year then our underwriter as uh, scheduled credits and you get merits in a credit form for your loss history and so when you bring the whole thing across from your base rate then you've got your credits applied to it and that comes out to be where the premium falls and we have the ability to adjust those up or down um, to keep your premium down I did also speak to um, Alan Berg, our assessor, on another topic, and we just um, got talking about this uh, bid recommendation today, and he knows of some municipalities that insure with MML, and he said he's had nothing but a positive experience. He has nothing bad at all to say about them. Good reference. Okay. <clears throat> I have no further questions, Mr. Mayor. Uh, anyone else? Questions? Yes. Good. Um, I had several questions and they were kind of up into that final um, spreadsheet uh, from what I had this morning. So uh, I'm comfortable with that. Any other 
questions on that? Right, okay, so well, let me see. I move we uh, award the property and liability bid to Michigan Municipal League for the annual premium of $139,948. Second. See how I made it run back to the desk. Councilman <laughs> Nowak? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Yes. Mayor Malagora? Aye. Mayor Potem Johnson? Yes. And Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, Anna. Next up, we have the second reading of Ordinance 21-465, which amends the City of Alpena Zoning Ordinance Articles 2, 5, and 7. Read this, uh, this policy, unless somebody specifically asked me to read it, but this mainly deals with food truck and food truck park, where they're located, but uh, I think the last time you were here, the fine was also available. I'm not sure if she's on there tonight. Um, but this also uh, basically cleaned up and made it uh, easier to read where some of the other business establishments can be located. For instance, coffee shops, you know, restaurants with drive through things of that nature. And it lays out where they're permitted by right and where they might be permitted by special. So it's a, basically a restatement uh, in a little more readable form of what was in the ordinance uh, and also Let's say adding the food truck and the food truck park. So I uh, would just need a uh, vote yay or nay. Uh, before we do that, I just want to point out that um, I was expecting Leland Bruni here in my position today, and I had put her name on these, so I will have to strike that on both of the ordinances. So I move we adopt Ordinance 21 465. Councilman Osmer? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Potem Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. And Councilman Noah? Yes. Thank you. Next up is the second reading of Ordinance 21466, which amends the city of Alpena zoning map. Bill? Uh, this one is uh, also second reading. And this is to specifically rezone the parcel located at 1010 South 11th Avenue from RM2. B1, and I think you have the uh, map that's attached, and also I think there were some questions last time, I can't remember if you remember, but about uh, making this consistent with uh, the rest of the block, and so I think that's uh, what it intends to do. I don't know if Montiel has anything that she wanted to add. No, that's correct. Um, the rest of that section is currently B1, um, so they're looking to make it B1 basically to the corner. Vote your name at this point. So I move we adopt ordinance 21 466. Second. Mayor Waldora? Aye. Mayor Putnam Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. And Councilman Osmer? Yes. Thank you. Next up is first reading of Ordinance 21-467, which amends Chapter 18, Section 18-1 of the Medical Marijuana Facilities and Adult Use Marijuana Establishments. This is uh, quite lengthy, and although I'm willing to read it, I'm hoping nobody asked me to read it, I'm going to be prepared. Uh, I was just going to highlight it. This obviously, we already have a medical marijuana um, ordinance this is going to in a sense replace that uh, and adopt both medical and adult use marijuana in the state one so uh, section 18 one starts out with uh, under uh, subchapter a the purpose intent uh, in relationship to other laws number two is uh, basically stating that this is the legislative intent of this body to adopt these ordinances consistent with state law and the other regulations that are found uh, inside here. There is a relationship to federal law. Uh, and uh, one thing that's important to note in here is that nothing in this ordinance is intended to grant immunity from any criminal prosecution under federal law. As we all know, marijuana is still a Schedule One controlled substance and it's still illegal under federal law. Um, this does also point out that 
broadcasting this in relationship with the state uh, marijuana licensing acts for both medical and adult use. Um, subsection B uh, basically says we're adopting uh, regular, or excuse me, the definitions, and those are contained in the state laws. Uh, those state ordinances or state laws, excuse me, statutes lay out certain definitions we're simply adopting those by reference um, number c is the local licensing authority that is something that mr blair just mentioned when he spoke during public comment uh, under uh, two of that section the number of permitted facilities uh, i spoke with rachel about this and, and at least uh, from my memory the last time we were here when we addressed this in a special meeting uh, there was some talk about excess grower and we had initially prohibited excess growers but I think Mr. Blair uh, kind of explained to council that um, you know excess grower is uh, defined by state law as somebody who grows in more than five places and whether it made sense to limit those or whether we wanted to have more experienced growers also have the opportunity uh, to grow marijuana here There's there aren't a whole lot of spots in the city where somebody could be a grower, uh, uh, but we also talked about, you know, is, is there a number that we could set? And if we did, it would probably be arbitrary. None of us gets really have enough experience with, you know, does two make sense? Does three make sense? Does four make sense? But so I changed that uh, to unlimited. Obviously, that's that's something that was talked about at the last meeting, and probably something that consider whether it should be unlimited or whether you did want to prohibit it. Um, there's obviously uh, licensing fees or annual fees required. There's applications required, application requirements that were consistent with our previous um, medical ordinance or medical uh, marijuana ordinance. There's a review process laid out in here. Uh, there's a process for uh, if we denied an application, uh, what a person could do to, in a sense, appeal that uh, on due process grounds. Um, this would uh, obviously require us to uh, issue licenses, licenses to the establishment, but recreational establishments as well. It has a uh, procedure for how a license uh, could come into forfeiture. Uh, it has uh, what occurs on license renewal. It lays out uh, how, how somebody might be able to transfer a license. Um, this is a revocable privilege, so if the licensee does not comply with the standards, it, the license could be revoked, uh, could be suspended for a period of time as well. Uh, there are some general requirements regarding signage, hour of cooperation, things of that nature that appeared in our medical uh, ordinance as well. Uh, there are certain prohibited acts, for instance, Marijuana can't be smoked, used, or consumed in the facility. Uh, there is the authority of uh, the city to inspect licensed premises. Um, there's also a penalty section, a violation section. Uh, if we found that there was some uh, violation of the ordinance that doesn't require revocation of the license, but something that uh, makes somebody in violation and whether it would be a penalty, a financial penalty, they would have to uh, fix that as well if they were in violation of, of this act. Uh, and that's a, a, I guess a brief summary of the ordinance. It's, it's fairly, fairly long and has a lot of information. Well, I noticed the uh, spelling mistake in the title. It's um, on the second line where it says medical. Missing an A. You see it? Yep, right in the first paragraph after section 18 1. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Gold star? That's fine, no secretary's fault. Well. <laughs> 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 well, that was quick. <laughs> I'll take the help with right <laughs> And um, to address um, Mr. Blair's uh, comments, um, what I would 
what I would like is because it's the first reading, it's the first time this has um, been dispersed to the public. So I'm sure we'll probably get some other um, questions or um, comments about the ordinance prior to its full approval next week. If, if, it might be easier if you could, if anyone could email um, your concerns and comments to to all of council. And, and if and if I receive it, I mean my my email address is on our website. All of us is our. But if I receive something that the rest of council doesn't, I always forward it, and vice versa. I think that that would probably be a little bit easier. Um, because I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that now that this has been provided to the public, we we'll probably get more than more than just your um, comments if if you think that sounds okay. Um, and other than that, I mean, I I, I have a few things I kind of wanted to review too. But as far as other than what what Mr. Blair or anybody else in the public might bring to our attention before next. Meeting, I really didn't see anything that was alarming. It's yeah, I spoke with Rachel about this because one of the questions that she posed to me was, uh, you know, if we have first reading tonight, does council absolutely have to pass it at the second reading? You would not have to do that. <laughs> so if you wanted to slow down a little, that would be perfectly fine. Um, and uh, you know, if you wanted to take comments or give people an opportunity, we are just rolling this out tonight. But uh, if you have some further feedback, that's certainly something that council can do if you would like to do that. Sure. Okay. And, and I, I can't remember what it was, but there was one, there was a, an ordinance in the past that we brought to second reading and ended up bringing it back to a third time. I don't remember what it was, but I'd like to keep it on the agenda for our next meeting as a second reading. And then we'll just, we'll just cross that bridge when we get there. If we have enough that we want to change um, that you're not comfortable taking it as a an, an accepted second reading with minor adjustments if it's major enough for you and you want to bring it back a third time i think that's wise okay yeah, that's fine okay. anything else anybody wanted to address on that one before we move on no? okay thanks all right e is the costs and voter turnout of the november 2nd 2021 election Okay, the cost for the November 2nd city election totaled $10,751. The largest expense was the ballots and memory cards at $4,066. Election worker expense was $2,496, which is low because of consolidated precincts and less workers needed for a small election. Also, we didn't have an absentee ballot counting board as we opted to process the absentee ballots in the precincts. The city had 8,585 registered voters at the time of the election, which is an increase of 62 voters since the May election. The voter turnout was 17%, which equals 1,478 voters. Of that total, 861 voters, or 58%, were absentee voters. The largest voter demographic at 640, or 43% of the total, was once again comprised of females age 60 and older. Combined precinct four and five, located at the First United Methodist Church, had the highest turnout among the precincts with 657, or 44% of total voters. I did also attach um, the reports, the voter turnout statistics, which I think are kind of interesting to look at. Um, if you could make sense of it. Um, could you go to the next slide, Charlie? There you go. So this is voter turnout just by absentees. And then the second one is combined. Any questions or comments on, on that? One question. Yeah. Notice a consistency from 2020 in the absentee ballots or did it remain about the same yeah so um our absentee voters has continued to increase since it was passed um, on proposal 183 um, we used to only have about 200 people on our permanent absentee list and now we have over 1800 
So every election, we send those 1,800 people an, um, an application for a ballot. We are not automatically sending ballots. We are just sending applications to those people that, that told us they wanted them. Um, so we've been doing that and um, we had, we still had quite a few, even though it was a smaller election. So yeah, we had more absentees than we had in-person voters. It's the way it's going. <laughs> <laughs> we do appreciate everybody that uh, did come out either way and vote. Very much appreciated. Anna, do you, um, just one quick question about um, elections because it's because this was once again um, um, only, the only thing on the ballot was the city. It, is it, um, if my memory serves, are, is the window still open for council to switch to odd years? I mean, I'm sorry, to even years, or is that something that we missed a window? Um, no, I think that window is always open. Always. Um, that is something that I get asked a lot about. Um, it would be it would be a cost savings for us for sure. I mean, we wouldn't have this ten thousand seven hundred and fifty one dollars of expense. It would, in order to make that happen, I think somehow we would have to extend a term. To um, we understand how. Yeah. It, right. Right. It was still a, an yeah. opportunity, so that, that's fine. I didn't want to get into a big. No. Yeah. Feel about it at this point, and somebody wanted to bring it up at a future meeting. I just wanted to know if that was still an opportunity. Yeah. I couldn't remember if there was a window or not. So we would have actually had this um, this election, or this whole entire year, we would have had an election. Um, we had the one in May, but only because it was missed on the November of 20 ballot. But other than that, we would have had a year off. Okay. Thank you. Need to receive and file on that, or is it just informational? I move we receive and file. Or Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Councilman Osborne? Yes. And Mayor Walker. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next up is new business. We have a fluoride presentation from Steve Schultz. <clears throat> I'm just gonna do the introduction. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, in response to the current uh, supply shortage and shipping issues experienced worldwide, Suez staff has prepared a presentation for informational purposes to outline the options related to specific chemicals added in the water production process that are not necessarily required by law uh, or by, by permit process or anything like that. Um, this one in, in question tonight is fluoride. Um, and we have Tuba from New Jersey tuning in from, from Suez and she's going to do a presentation for us. On, on that tonight. Hello, good evening, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hello from New Jersey. I'm going to keep this uh, short and sweet of uh, 10 minutes. So um, I'm um, from SUA's engineering department within technical services, and I am a support function to any of our SUA's contracts within the United States. We have about 67 contracts. So anytime there is an action that or study that needs to be done, my, me and my team members come in and take a look at the existing operations and find out ways to improve um, those uh, concerns. So uh, today's discussion will be about uh, discontinuing fluoridation and some action items. Um, should I share? Oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> so why add fluoride to water? Uh, water fluoridation, basically just adding very small amounts of fluoride to public water supplies in order to reduce the prevalence of cavities. And this was the primary and the major, most important factor of why we're adding it is for oral health. And topical fluoride, which is found in the drinking water, is most effective in children ages 3 through 16, either in the form of drinking water or toothpaste. And fun fact, 1945, Grand Rapids, Michigan was the first city in the U.S. to add fluoride to their water system, and others followed. And the current CDC recommended level of fluoride concentration, the optimum level is 0.7 milligram per liter. And when we looked at CDC website, which is 
periodically updated and we have the most recent numbers from 2020, I believe the most recent year, um, full year is that Michigan has a fluoridation rate of 41% of all water systems currently add fluoride as the last step. And that equals to 89% of the entire floor, um, Michigan state population, which means that um, the, the bigger the system, the higher the chance of fluoridation. The smaller systems usually tend to shy away from fluoridation that comes with procurement, maintenance, operation. You need more people, you need more budget. So they need to, sh they, they are shying away from it. And the 0.7 concentration that we just talked about, only 31% of the state population have access to optimally fluoridated water, some of which is between 0.6 and 1. Uh, the remainder is falling behind. Either they're adding too little or they're adding too much. Um, and Michigan, Michigan Eagle states that a news re release is required if the city is forced to interrupt fluoride addition to inform the public health and professionals. The reason why that box is added is because Alpina this year faced um, a little bit of scare because they didn't have their fluoride supply. So if we go to the next slide, we'll uh, talk about the background, why we had to bring this up today to you. So um, the fluoridation in Alpina basically is done because it is uh, ha it was being done before Suez came in. It's not a listed obligation on the current contract. And fluoride all over the United States, it's not a, a mandatory requirement by any state or federal, federal regulatory agencies. And it remains a community decision that um, council people like you and the town people, they come together and they make this decision to whether uh, fluoride is necessary or not necessary for that community in the drinking water form. And um, Alpina received recognition from Michigan Eagle for maintaining optimal fluoridity system for years. So they have been doing this for a very long time and they've been getting acknowledged, but lately they've been experiencing difficulty obtaining the dry powder form from the supplier. And I believe that in July, there was an RFQ uh, out for the, the dry supply and there was only one bidder that responded and that one bidder was uh, awarded. And uh, due to COVID pandemic, not just the dry, <laughs> the dry fluoride, but we're seeing supply chain issues with a lot of the chemicals around a treatment plant. And um, this one came up. So to mitigate this problem, Suez found dry fluoride supply from our other operations around the United States. I think some of them came from Northeast to supply Alpina for a couple of more months. I think we have enough supply right now for January to take us through and we have to make you know, another decision whether to find it uh, from other operations, if they have it or switch the supplier, if there is interest if there is a you know, supply of dry fluoride in the United States, we have to, we are at, we're at this point where we have to make a decision um, to make sure we either continue with the fluoride or we found a source for it or we discontinue. Um, next slide, please. So solutions and alternatives. We have three paths to choose from. The current, uh, the, the number one path is to seek alternative suppliers and void contract with the current supplier since they have not able to fulfill the obligations of their current contract. With this option, the cost may go higher than the previous contract due to shortages and expedited shipments um, because there is a smaller pool to choose from with the dry fluoride suppliers. And the current cost for the powder fluoride is approximately $6,900 per year. Um, and to continue these operations, some of the ongoing maintenance um, expenses are, you know, multi-gas filters for the operators, maintenance of feed equipment and regular calibration. Um, the expenses under these items are just maintenance and they're recurring. And 6,900 is the main cost per year. And the number two option is to switch from powder fluoride to more available form of fluoride, which is hydrofluorosilicic acid, which is a liquid, uh, liquid solution 
of fluoride. And this is more available and more convenient than the powder form because a lot of the modern treatment plant facilities are moving to liquid injection rather than mixing the powder form into a solution. And this will contain capital costs for engineering design, equipment installation of the retrofitted system for fluoride um, injection. And I had a preliminary conversation with Fishback Engineering and they were hesitant to give me a price, but we're looking at at least $100,000 for one-time costs. And the estimated cost for the actual supply will go three times higher than the powdered form. Um, and with this one, it is a uh, very high risk for our operators. It is considered to be the most toxic chemical in the treatment plan. It requires additional ventilation. So the current space dedicated to fluoride will not be suitable for this. We need to make sure there is enough uh, air switch and ventilation for health and safety of everyone who enters that space. And this upgrade will require eagle notification and permit approval. It's a pretty standard one. If, you know, the town would like to stick with the fluoride and a lot of them do go from the dry to liquid, um, but it will be, one-time expense for capital costs and there will be higher uh, recurrent expenses more than the seven thousand dollars that's spent on powdered form per year and the third option is to discontinue fluoridation altogether this requires guidance from the michigan eagle sorry a public notification by a news release possibly a local town hall meeting followed by a council vote submit the vote outcome to Michigan Eagle for approval. Um, Michigan Eagle leaves us to the community. Again, it is a community-based decision. There is no regulatory enforcement of fluoride. They, we just have to make sure all parties, all public is informed and there are no objections. If there are objections, they're addressed. Um, why stop fluoridation? Um, the number one reason that brought this issue up was the global supply chain issues due to COVID impacting the inventory and shipments. And that uh, there is no federal state regulatory requirement for fluoride addition. So removing fluoride from the system doesn't violate any rules and regulations. And if we switch to liquid, um, you know, if we are considering liquid, there is um, the, the health and safety factor to consider about um, keeping that form on the treatment plant the storage, feed, and transportation, everyone has to be a lot more careful not to get impacted by it. Um, and once it's added, it has to be regulated not to exceed a maximum contaminant level, uh, level of uh, four milligram per liter. So it creates demand for monitoring testing procedures within the treatment plant. By removing that, we are giving more time to our operations team to focus on actual quality of the water. And customers who don't want fluoride, have no practical way of removing it. The the Brita filters that we get from stores don't actually remove fluoride. Uh, it might take reverse osmosis to actually remove it. If you don't want it in your system, um, then you'll shy away from tap water, basically. Um, many more people have access to dental care and dental hygiene compared to 1950s. The reason why fluoride was added was because in the 1950s, not many people had dental hygiene practices in place and um, access to fluoride or toothpaste fluoride wasn't as common as it was today um, and the less than 20 percent of alpina population is made of ages under 16 which is the critical age period for fluoride benefits when we think about why the fluoride is added it is to target the younger people but if one fifth of the population is only benefiting from the fluoride addition uh, that's another thing to consider and uh, like I said before, there are many everyday alternatives to consume fluoride, toothpaste, mouthwashes, nutrition, soft drinks, juices. We have a lot of sources for it besides tap water. 11% of non-fluoridated water systems in Michigan are made up of less populated municipalities. So that also puts Alpena in this category where um, smaller the municipality, the, the less likely the fluoridation will take place because of the higher per capita fluoridation cost plus smaller staff operations. It puts the 
the burden on the existing staff. And um, another fact is that less than 10 percent of water usage is for drinking water. The rest is for non-potable usage, such as showering, toilets, um, laundry, um, kitchen, like um, washing dishes. Um, Ten percent of the water that we actually consume, we consume it orally. Um, and Alpina receives customer service calls voicing concerns about fluoride addition and fluoride chemical safety data. So, in the past, there has been inquiries into the fluoride being added into the, the tap water. And um, I think it's documented, or Steve or Mike could uh, elaborate more on that. But it seems like it caught some um, some uh, people's attention. And um, it, I just don't know the makeup of Alpina that much to you know really figure out what the concerns of the the, the residents are. But this seems to be a topic. So next one, please. If we're going with number three, which is the defluoridation, this is continuing fluoride entirely. There are a couple of steps that needs to be taken that Michigan Eagle wants us to do, which is meeting up with Michigan Eagle to identify those critical steps and determining the internal strategy for how do we notify, notify the public what kind of um, outreach that we do, what kind of information we present to them and then distribution of advance notice to consumers and medical professionals. This includes the dentists and hospitals. And council meeting discussion and council vote to determine outcome and circle back with Eagle and notify them of the governmental action. So these are all the alternatives that we have and action items that are attached to each of those alternatives. And again, this is not fluoride is right or wrong. This is about what is right for the community. What does um, Alpina need at this point to continue their water treatment? Um, whether fluoride will be a recurring topic in these meetings because we either don't have um, uh, we don't have access to it due to supply chain, or it has to be another meeting about um, upgrading the facilities to a more modern system and spending a little more or just this continuation of it and see what the concerns and what the uh, questions from the public will be. I hope I can hold some minutes. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, and the mics, if they have anything to add. Uh, either mics, these mics. Okay, just here as representatives. Yeah, any talk questions? <laughs> uh, in the in the thirty five years that I've been involved in Alpena, I've never had one comment from from the public that they liked fluoride in their water. Uh, and I've had many comments that they dislike adding things to the water that aren't necessary. Uh, so that's just a historical perspective of what I've seen. Not a lot of comments. Um, there were a number of chiropractors that were very vocal that they did not want fluoride added to the water because they felt that there was uh, an imp negative impact on the skeletal structure of, of humans caused by fluoride. <clears throat> I do want to say that we have had a very, very good record of maintaining the optimum uh, concentration of fluoride in the system. We've actually received awards uh, from the Michigan Dental Association and from Eagle. And they actually, because of our good record, they uh, presented us with a grant to to buy new fluoride, powdered fluoride um, addition equipment. So that's that's not really a problem. The biggest problem we have is we're, we're forced with the decision that we have to make because we don't have powdered fluoride available. So it may be a decision that's forced upon us unless the council wants to continue they think that the uh, public is thinks that it's a benefit enough that they want to continue uh then it's going to mean a pretty substantial investment in, in uh, new equipment and we really we wanted to present all of the information so the council could make an informed decision um it might not be a bad idea to have a, a public hearing and uh publicize it and see if there's any negative comments about not fluoridating the water. 
I um thank you, Mike. I I certainly appreciate that. Um, and I always appreciate public input uh, and professionals' input. Um, so so just from my personal perspective, um, kind of feel like this might be a blessing in disguise. I I get a lot of negative. Well, when I say a lot, if I compare it to any other topic, it's probably easily in the top ten of um, negative comments I get via email or um, or otherwise is the fluoride in the water. Um, so so I, I really I honestly don't have an issue with defluoridization de um, and pursuing that, um, but doing it correctly, um, I don't. I think a public hearing might be might be the the best way to do it my only apprehension is is that are we is there going to be i don't want to have a public hearing to have a public hearing i don't want to sound horrible but if that's the direction we're going to have to go because we can't get it um mm -hmm. unless some unless we want unless we would expect that there would be an incredible outcry to keep it that we would that we would potentially invest that significant amount of money and then put employees at risk at the same time with the hazardousness of the liquid, I, I guess I'm, I'll leave that up to perspective, but. Question I would have in this is since we provide water to the township, would that also include the township residents in wealth uh, city residents? We never disclude anyone from a public hearing, to be honest with you, but, um, but it, you know, it may be best if, if nothing else, it, it would be a, um, it would be educational for all of us and anyone else to have to have some dialogue about it. So I told Rachel today that that I do have some background in the conversion from the uh, powder to the uh, liquid back years ago up in Kinross. Um, they had converted to the liquid, but quickly determined that it was quite corrosive and. Uh, they suffered a lot of workman's comp claims because of it, it's like this, in that, in that nature. And uh, to come down to the fact that it really wasn't a requirement, both by federal and state standards, it's like this, it wasn't worth the cost to workman's comp, the uh, health of the individuals, uh, the cost of the equipment, uh, everything else that was all told into it like this, to, the return just wasn't there for it. So. So in order to have a public hearing, what's the what is what's the timeline look like to, to do that? Unless there's is there is there any issues with having a public hearing and moving forward? No. Do, do we have to like meet with Eagle first and and start the that can kind of be done? I think they're they're not necessarily steps in that order. We we kind of know some of those steps. We know that we have to to meet with those representatives. I think that can be done in a timely fashion. You know, between meetings or whatever. Um, you know, initially we were thinking that we had enough time to maybe just even give you a chance to kind of mull it over and think about it. Um, you know, but you could call a public meeting for the the next, you know, the second meeting in December. And in that meantime, we can certainly send some emails. And, right. and I mean, there's a distinction here between a public hearing and a public meeting right. to, you know, one because we have to notify in a certain amount of time, but I don't know that EGLE has specific requirements, um, that's something we could certainly confirm. But I would think having a, um, what they suggested, a town hall meeting or just an mm -hmm. opportunity for public input on this specific subject at the next meeting would be good. Yeah, just have it as an agenda item, not a, not, mm -hmm. I don't think it has to go as far as our typical public, right. you know, um, hearings where we have to have a 10 day, you know, advertising period or whatever. This is, you know, right. Because we give the public an opportunity and they know about it ahead of time, which they certainly will. Sure. I think that's really good information. That, and then maybe it would be helpful if we put it out on our website and our Facebook page for the yep. public review. Yeah, definitely. Sounds reasonable. Yeah. It has a Suez trademark on it, so I'll have to make sure that they're okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I can certainly send this out to the media afterward. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, let's start that step. Those. Okay. That. Steve, appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, Mike. <laughs>
All right, next up is the citywide boiler inspection bid recommendation from Steve as well. Okay, on November 15th, 2021, the city received and opened bids for the citywide boiler inspections. Bids were sent to four firms as well as posted on the city's website with one bid received as follows. Um, and there's, I'm not gonna read them all off. There's a table there outlining their costs from 2022 to 2024. Um, they compare uh, quite nicely with uh, the previous contract. Um, and, you know, they, they've done this before for us. Weinkoff has done this work for us before. Um, the intent of the project is to perform annual boiler inspections in accordance with the 2009 Michigan Boiler Code, Rule 27, which requires a service technician to be certified to perform the annual testing. This is, you know, this came about, like it says, in, in 09. So it was something that we could do by ourselves before, but now it's something that we we can't we can't do this on our own. So we have to hire it out, this portion anyway. Uh, the state of Alpena shall have the right to extend this contract for one additional three-year period if both parties can mutually agree upon prices, and in no case shall it be shall it be extended beyond December 31st of 2027. It's my recommendation as city engineer that we award the citywide boiler inspection contract to Weinkoff Plumbing and Heating at the prices listed above. Uh, Weinkoff Plumbing and Heating holds all the required mechanical licensing for the inspections. Steve, I've got a couple of questions. Yes, you I would. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't like the single bids. Have we reached out to the the other bidders? Do they even have the required credentials to bid on this? I mean, or, or is there others that they could recommend within the state? Yep, they um, they all do. And what we found out is um, the we didn't get a call back from uh, one of them. Uh, there was another one in West Branch that they just said it, it's too far okay. to come and go uh, back and forth. Um, one of the ones that has bid on this before, one of our local bidders uh, indicated to us today that they did not get the the email or did not know that it was out for bid. Um, we checked the email address that we sent it to. They said that that was the correct one and we show where we sent it. So I, I don't know, got lost in in somewhere but they they did you know they they bid in 2016 against Weinkoff and Weinkoff got that bid also so yeah. any other questions or issues <laughs> okay, I can motion to hear that Osmer. He made the motion. So moved. Osmer. Yeah, Mr. Osmer. Mr. Osmer. Mr. Osmer did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just selecting now. Yeah. <laughs> so I move. Councilman Mitchell. Yes. Councilman Noack. Yes. Councilman Osmer. Yes. Mayor Walagora. Aye. And Mayor Potem Johnson. Yes. Jim Carey. Thank you. Uh, next is the bag leaf and lawn material pickup bid recommendation, Steve, as well. All right. On November 15th as well, uh, we received uh, an open bids for the bag leaf and lawn material pickup services for 22, 23, and 24. Bid documents were sent to five vendors and also posted on the city's website with one bid received as follows. Uh, A1 tree service for 22, 23, and 24 were $10,100 per, per pickup. We usually schedule for four. We end up doing five generally. Um, if the budget allows for a total of 40400 per year, um, that's in line with the last two years of the, the previous contract. So A1 Tree Service has provided outstanding service as well as exceptional working relationship for many years to the city, providing stump grinding services as well as previous, previously providing bag lawn material pickups throughout the city. As there has been no increase from last year of the previous contract as well as no increase for years 23 and 24, of the proposed contract, it's my recommendation as city engineer that city council award the bag leaf and lawn material pickup to A1 Tree Service for the as bid prices listed above. Funding has been established in the public works budget for the service. I recall, Steve, when we started uh, outsourcing this, we were we did a study basically. This is years ago on you know the cost versus city services. Yeah. Doing this, and there was the opportunity cost of things that they couldn't be doing because of the time that it, that it took. Um, have we, do you recall or have any remember. information on when that was done? No? I don't, I don't write off. Okay. I'm sure we could dig it up. Okay. But, uh, 
yeah i mean this is this is ugly work yeah no i mean there's there's another contractor that had bid on this previously and they're right now they're out of business um this is just yeah you're opening up every you're touching every bag of leaves that somebody has put together opening it up dumping it discarding the bag transporting all those leaves it's yeah it's not pretty work no <laughs> we're just trying to for the public's information just to kind of establish why we went this way and yeah and you know the cost savings that we did realize at that time you know yeah i mean it's we, we struggle even now um for for the uh the brush pickup to get the crew and get enough people to be doing that and then to add this to it i think that was a lot of it too is that we struggled just with the brush pickup because that's a lot of work for us to get through mm -hmm. No other questions, Mr. Mayor. Right. I move that we award the contract for leaf pick up to A1 <clears throat> tree service at the uh, prices listed for 22, 23, and 24. Second. Councilman Noah? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Jensen? Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> I move we adjourn to closed session for a client discussion on the sale of city owned property located at US 23 North. Councilman Osmer? Yes. Mayor Walmart? Mayor Potem Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. All right. And our on online viewers and perhaps media have probably seen that there is possible action on this after uh, we resume. So I don't know uh, if in the event that that happens, Rachel, is there is, is there a press release? A press release has been, will be um, provided. So to kind of keep you from hanging on the line all this time, if you'd like. It was funny last time we went into closed session and you were ready to get it. So we're back in uh, we're back in uh, open session. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we are. All right. We got one one still with us. All right. Go ahead. We we do have some action to take care of um, uh, beforehand. Um, so when you're ready, the topic is I don't even lost my agenda. So thank you, sir. So the, the topic was uh, uh, the sale of city-owned property located on US 23 North. And go ahead, Bill. So the uh, first motion for council's consideration would be to approve as written the uh, purchase and sale agreement between GT Equities LLC and the city of Alpena and authorize uh, Mayor Wallagora to sign the same on behalf of the city. So moved. Second. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Putin Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Councilman Oscar? Yes. Agreed? Thank you. Second motion would be to agree, uh, or excuse me, to approve the buy and sell agreement between PCI and the city of Alpena with two modifications. One, that the requirement that the city uh, provide at the city's expense a survey within 30 days of the date that this agreement is signed under section five would be removed. And second, that the date for the written acceptances offer would be extended under paragraph 24 from December 1st of 2021 to December 10th of 2021. And also to authorize Mayor Wallagora to sign on behalf of the city. So moved. Support. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Yes. And Mayor Walbrook? Aye. Third motion for council's consideration would be to approve, uh, as written, the agreement between WSSA LLC and the city of Alpena for the purchase and sale of the property uh, noted in that with one uh, change. And that is that the city 
would reserve the discretion to move the proposed three acre site from the north side of North Industrial Highway as presented in the purchase and sale agreement to the south side of North Industrial Highway. And further, uh, once again, that Mayor Wallagora have authority to sign on behalf of the city of Elkin. So moved. Second. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Councilman Osmer? Mayor Wallagora? Aye. And Mayor Pro Johnson? Yes. We can adjourn. I right, move we adjourn. Second. Third. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.